with with me today, we've got uh, Andy Rayner from Nebion, a Sony company, Gareth Sylvester Bradley from Sony, a Sony company, and <laughs> Roger Sashlato from Avid, not yet a Sony company, to the best of my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, for so many can, I, can I just can I just say the um the, the the COVID impact on you, sir, with 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 the with the hair and the beard is quite astounding. <laughs> you know, you look nothing like you did this time of VidTrans last year. Uh, that's true, and I, I have a selfie someplace that I took uh, about a year minus a week ago at uh, the last human interaction event I had, and it was uh, well, the last face to face interaction event I had. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was quite something. But, we do uh, all still have some uh, some grey hairs hairs in this panel as well, I think. Yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> well, indeed. Those that still have hair. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Well, you know, twenty one ten robbed me of my uh, youthful appearance, apparently. <laughs> um, but it, it's been interesting. the The process, you know, transitioned from a, you know, a lot of use cases and a lot of, uh, you know, how would we do this. To then, you know, the the technical committee work over several years to create the 2110, you know, stream documents, which started out in the VSF, went into SIMTI for proper standardization, and they've been done for really quite some time. So, you know, we've seen now the equipment industry put out, you know, a lot of equipment that actually speaks 2110. The JTM tested events were extremely helpful at finding the the loose edges of the perimeter of reasonable implementation and kind of tightening that noose to where it's expected when you walk in and commission a project now that 2110 things will plug together and work. And it's unusual if they don't. Um, the same is becoming true of NMOS. And I, I think that's the, uh, the first question I want to put to my colleagues is, uh, what would you say about the state of finishedness of ISO 4 and ISO 5 in particular, which are really the parts you need just to get connection management working? I would, I would say the, um, my observation from the deployments of probably, being honest, only the last 18 months really, is, is that those basic tenants of the control plane, which we've worked on, you know, are now business as usual. And although that's a bit boring, that's where we've needed to get to as an industry. Um, so whilst some of the other elements of the NMOS suite are, you know, to be honest, still evolving, the, the basic tenants of that, you know, controlling connectivity operation, um, I think is, is done and dusted. And I think, as you alluded to, most of the key industry players are now actually playing ball. I think there's one or two exceptions and one or two wobbles around the edges, but largely speaking, you know, it's business as usual, it's plug and play for those elements, which is which is great. Mm -hmm. And I think it's I think it's really um, uh, what our colleagues have just said about having things like the JTM tested program, which have really um, brought that forward. And I know something that um, Kieran said in his um, presentation earlier that having um, tests and um, the documents around, not just the specifications themselves, is is critical um, for for these kind of things. So all of the work in the uh, AMWA on the NMOS testing tool and packaging that as a container that can be used, and then its use in JTM tested um, has has really made a, I think a, a big difference, as you say, over that kind of last eighteen months. And the great thing about control plane stuff is that you can you can test it remotely very easily. So and, and you can pause things, you can verify things. So, you know, I think it's another lesson from the, the 2020 nightmare is that actually it's forced us to actually think about what can we actually do at home. And, you know, proving out control plane behavior is actually something we can quite straightforwardly do. Oh, for sure. I mean, we've done you know, NMOS integrations and NMOS tests, both, you know, using VPNs within AMWA, but also just vendor to vendor quite a bit. And uh, it's it works fine. Now, getting to that second question about, um, you know, the what Felix Pelon used to refer to as the dematerialized facility. You know, we we think in terms of virtual machines now and software-based workflow elements that pop up and spin down and all this. Does NMOS work for that? 
I think there's, a, there's definitely the need. Sorry, sorry, Roger. Yeah. Uh, so uh, definitely there's a need. Uh, so especially when you have um, something like a, a cloud player, which is going to send a stream to someplace else, it's just a software artifact that can be spun up or, or shut down. So it's, it's not like a, a, a constantly on piece of hardware. And so I think uh, having some uh, ability to um, you know, fire up an instance and then have it be registered and, and uh, be able to use it then using the standard tools is, is I think a need that, that can uh, uh, probably be addressed. I thought, yeah, I think that's, I think that's really um, right. And one of the things I think we have there is a, is a kind of a historical baggage in our, in our language. You know, we talk about in the, in the reference architecture and, and in the NMOS specs about devices. And, uh, you know, I think most of us think about those devices as, as pieces of hardware I can, I can touch and lovingly press its, uh, their, their buttons. Um, but actually the device, it, it, a virtual device is still a device and uh, we can spin those up and, and take those down um, and 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 it's still all of the all of the concepts actually still work in 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 that way of thinking. Yeah, there's a few fundamentals like I guess you know, largely speaking, we're dealing with unicast flows, but from a control plane perspective, that's really that's really not an issue. And I think there may be in the future as we start stitching things together, one or two other things we need to address for a holistic control plane proposition but largely speaking i think the tools are applicable even though they're actually enacting on things that are uh, yeah dematerialized <laughs> right. now one of the interesting things that I, I people attribute sometimes to nmos the idea that it's going to solve all the world's problems and I, one of my standard jokes in my own talks is that it doesn't. It only solves one particular problem really well, which is this 2110 connection management challenge. But there are other problems in the world, and they've weren't they've needed solution for years. But here we are finally. Um, the the layer above NMOS, the layer above you know, sort of these devices that really stipulates you know how do the devices and flows and things fit together into a production? Is that an area where there's some value to the various trade associations and standards bodies trying to specify and standardize the parts? Or is that just something that the marketplace will innovate so fast we'll never catch up? I think there's one point that's worth reiterating um, on that, John, and it's something Brad said just now that, you know, we have to we have to ride the 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 what the telco um, industry is doing with its infrastructure, and so um, we always have to be be mindful of that, and we are going to be building things over over and up on top of that, but there is still work to do in the for 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 media specific um, layers. Yeah. I wonder, it's pure speculation, but, you know, impact on um, setting up a very dynamic environment, uh, say like a, a, a live sports production uh, where you bring in uh, a, a ton of equipment and try to jam it together in the week before a major event and uh, make, you know, try to shake out all the bugs and everything from something like that, where it's not a static at all environment and uh, you know, needs some uh, care and attention. Uh, to make sure it's all all working when all said and done. Yep, there's certainly a lot of innovation going on in that regard in the various event services providers. You know, your media group and other people are are very focused on that because they have this need to you know deploy equipment for one event and then recover it, reorganize it, deploy it for another, and they're trying to find that right balance between engineering investment and systems investment and per project, you know, per site investment is, is a constant target. But uh, there's definitely been a lot of learning there. Um, the trick is figuring out what of it really can be applied more generally or become, you know, I, I don't want to say community property, but can be exploited for the benefit of the whole industry versus what is really the, you know, um, 
proprietary know-how of the people who invent it. And it's just mm -hmm. like the technology that we all work on, but at the next level of the, the system. I, I certainly certainly think that we, um, we, we you know, one of the things that works really well in the, um, the AMWA activities is that we're always looking outward what we can use that's already out there that's already best practice i mean the the, the security pr um, specifications are are a really good example of that that we're we're just working out how the, uh, the you know the it best practice there applies and i think the work that the modeling activity is doing in amwa is really looking out at what else is out there for modeling at the that the device and service layer um, that that we can use as an architecture for for media devices um, uh, before building the level of, above that for whole whole production systems. Yeah, I think there's a there's a phrase several people have used is 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 we're we're, we're not we're now not just doing IP but IT and you know leveraging best practice you know everything from leaf spine architectures from data centers which we has become part of our dna in deploying you know media solutions through to the security best practice through to the way you actually do address discovery and device discovery all of the, all of those things um are, are really important and i think and you know the only way one, one of the big reasons for going to ip apart from the you know the temporal and um spatial format independence and all of those benefits is is the is the fact we're actually riding on the back of the IT industry in terms of the scale of which things are done as well as the flexibility that it gives us in terms of resource sharing um that, that we inherently get from that yeah, so speaking of resource sharing um you know everybody's talking about the cloud but is the cloud just an economic construct to rent computing time or is there really something that's being enabled technologically there that we could never have done before. So I think, you know, one, one, of, one of the things that's happened in the last in the last 12 months really is is the is the unveiling by AWS of CDI. And I know that's going to be talked about a bit a bit tomorrow um, by um, Evan, I, I believe. But um, I, I think some of these elements where we're starting to see the software platforms are actually ending up with constructs that allow deterministic data handoff. I think what we've been doing up until now is we you know most of us have come from a linear video heritage and everything that we've done in the way we've executed the way we process video even when it's been on compute to date has been to go back to and if you like 2110 does this inherently go back to the linear concept of video and i think what we're starting to see is innovation and obviously the innovation is on public cloud that's the way aws have launched it although it's on github it's it's been open sourced so it's available for the whole industry to use on private compute as well as public compute but i actually say compute actually works better the way you hand data off between virtual instances and um, can be done much better than the the raster inherited linear way that we actually have done it right until now so i think there's a cusp here of actually a starting to do things differently in compute not losing fact of the of the fact not losing sight of the fact it's we're we're still do, dealing with real time flows and we need to actually be time aware in the way we do things but we can but we can do it in a more compute friendly manner in the way we actually hand off data and the way we actually interface between different virtual processes i think there's there's a breakthrough that's really happening now and as i think you're gonna maybe cover a little bit later on john how we're starting mm -hmm. to embrace that a little bit in the work we're doing in vsf yep no that'll get covered tomorrow in the activity group uh, outputs but i think uh you, you're right there's certainly you know that aspect of forcing us to think differently about how we organize the computation product i mean historically you know, when video servers were introduced people treated them like tape machines that failed less often yeah. and in fact the original you know asc the company that became our server line was actually a videotape machine rental house that then on the side created a video server 
Um, and, I, you know, so that was really the model. But then now you look at how we use nonlinear editors and it's completely, you know, except for some of the vocabulary, it's unrelated to tape anymore. And, you know, will that be true of how we organize production? You know, at some point we'll just think about this big cloud full of streams and stuff comes in and magically the switcher finds it and pulls it in. I, I, I don't know. They're, they're not even streams that. anymore then at that point, right, John? They're just, uh, well, we'll use the word streams as an homage to a time in the past. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's interesting you should say say that because it does seem that, you know, this is the point where with things like ISA 4 and ISA 5 really, you know, complete and done, we're looking at places where we're heading towards actually rejoining the kind of the, the file-based way of working and the stream-based way of working. And, and we need some common concepts to really bring those two things together. Right, and that's that's something I think you know we were talking about with Roger earlier today. But the, this notion of how do the identities of the bits in motion and the production identity of the you know the assets and the files, how do they join up again? How do they get to where we're dealing with a common namespace? Well, I, I think from my point of view, we, we use the um, either capabilities. For example, a good old href, right? So if you have uh, a, an asset system that sits alongside devices, um, and then you can embed in the device information some hyperlinks to some, say, either RDF endpoints or other kinds of standardized metadata endpoints where you can get more information about a particular stream uh, that's on the wire, uh, and then be able to correlate that to whatever your business purpose is, whether you're trying to uh, validate that you're putting on air what you said you would um, or that uh, metadata is being synchronized so that as material comes in, uh, any annotations or uh, production side uh, notes have, are automatically synced up so you don't have to go look for things and tie them together manually. Hmm, that's interesting. It's sort of like the idea of the registry, but more as a way to collect the details around the content rather than the details around the physical devices. Yeah. Once you once you have these um, uh, you know pure compute devices, there are all sorts of you know opportunities for AI and machine learning um, in in our systems to do this sort of thing as well. I think. And I, and I think there's also um, as we start to look at more and more of the live workflow becoming compute based um, as we move forward, then there's more and more synergies with the file based NLE functions that have traditionally happened in a different sphere. And actually gradually bringing together, you know, that live workflow with, as Gareth just said, the, like the, the chunks of data with time representation that we used to consider a stream, um, you know, that we're heading more and more to an ecosystem that's, that's dealing with fragments of media um, and much more akin to file-based architectures. And, and therefore we can start to leverage, you know, much more of the synergy that actually exists between those two things in, in the way we actually do production, especially in the, what I call that near real-time NLE highlights type work, et cetera, as well as craft production downstream. Right. So do you suppose now that we've lived through a year of pandemic and we've learned all about, you know, all the, all the things that in various stages of production and delivery, we all said we would never, ever do X, Y, Z. We've now done them and tried them and sampled that fruit. Um, what's, what's your prognostication of the new normal, Andy? Yeah. The, the so Post-COVID, 18 months from now, if you walked yeah. out behind the stadium at a Premier League match, what would be there and what would be remote? So, yeah, I think as little as possible will be there. I think the what, what's actually happened is, and I think this happens in incremental steps, something forces people to actually think about working a different way. I've spoken to various broadcasters that had always said they would never consider a production system that has multiple frames of latency within it. Yet, as soon as augmented reality came along 
and people needed to insert that in their gallery to do a decent AR sports production, suddenly they're prepared to tolerate half a second of AR within a production workflow just because it gives them what they need, you know, at a decent price, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think looking forward to, you know, some of the what people have been putting up as no-go arguments for cloud-based infrastructure or off-prem, you know, long-hauling connectivity as business as usual to data centers um, and, you know, what I would call, you know, more you know, compute-based processing. A lot of those arguments, once people actually say, actually, we can do productions and then we can live with that, suddenly those barriers disappear. Yeah. And I think to that end, we are actually, you know, we have really, the last year has really triggered an acceleration towards people actually thinking, actually, that isn't really a barrier to actually achieving what we need to, and, we're, and therefore we can transition. So I think more and more of the dematerialization, be that private compute in a data center or, or, or a public cloud, I think is is going to happen and, and less and less equipment at locations in general. And you know, we've actually witnessed the rolling out of those kind of solutions in the last year ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Gareth, Roger, do you have any yeah, ideas? So, if you walk behind the stadium in Foxborough, it would be the same story. Um, you know, I, I have a little bit di different take because of, of the uh, sort of production or editing angle. So I have a colleague that uh, frequently takes time and works with uh, CBS to do live events. Uh, he works in the trucks, organizing media, working with the editor stations, uh, and keeping uh, that that editing workflow uh, very, very uh, smooth. He worked from home this time. And so one of the things that we're seeing uh, definitely from, from a media point of view is um, uh, trying to understand how to deal with the fact that you're not, you don't have a, a secure perimeter anymore. You can't just say, okay, we have the servers going into the trucks. Uh, we have very, very tight control of what goes in and out. Uh, therefore, we, we can be uh, confident that, we, that we're we protecting our media within that uh, perimeter. Now everybody's working from home. And so um, how do you protect that? How do you keep that media from escaping and, uh, uh, you know, sort of getting sort of pirated or, or you know, loss of monetization because of what, whatever happens in terms of leakage? So I think... You know, uh, dealing with that uh, loss of, of perimeter security is going to be a big issue coming up. Uh, don't know how it's going to get resolved, but I know it's becoming a it's, it's a big trend. I think that's um, I think that's uh, that's right, and I I I take on what Andy said about there being as little as um, possible in the uh, in the stadium. But then we know that um, moving streams backwards and forwards to the cloud is not necessarily the right thing to do. We want to move the right streams to the to the cloud. And it may be that we may actually be looking at places where actually we're gonna bring the compute down from the cloud in order to do the right processing locally and send then send the right streams back up to the um, cloud. So I think yeah. that, that um, and that maybe answers some of the things uh, around what Roger Roger was saying, we need you know we do the right things on site where we have a secure perimeter, uh, and we do we push the things that we want um, to go outside. So um, I think that'll be movement, being flexible in in where where things exist, while still having the same uh, control. Maybe we need the control plane to be able to move between the cloud and, and locally as well. Yeah, that's that really plays into the whole distributed production, doesn't it? So you're not necessarily doing everything in one place. You're doing all the different functions in the optimal yeah. places to right. make your system work most effectively. And if that's pre-grooming, pre-switching some elements in one location and doing the final prayers somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera, all of those different things come together. As long as you've got a control plane that actually can accommodate that multi-geographic distribution, mm -hmm. then, then that, that is where we're heading. Mm. Uh, so just leveraging on control plane for a minute in our waning moment, we we're done in three. The, uh, it, one of the interesting changes I see needing to happen in the industry, and I, it's unclear how quickly this can happen, is kind of a change of, I don't want to say ownership model, but of technology management model within facilities. That historically, you know, if you wanted to build a control room for a show, you contracted to a SI company that would build it out and organize the tally and organize all these other systems. 
and they were more or less fixed. And then you used that control room the way it was built for several years. And now, you know, we clearly are changing into a model where instead the whole thing is more dynamic, things are turned up and spun down. They're more like they're provisioned instead of simply being, you know, something that was designed and fixed and built by your predecessor before you ever got hired. Um, but this puts a lot of onus on the broadcaster themselves or the production company themselves to take some role in the software and systems and change management that right. goes around that. And that's um, at the risk of us as vendors dishing on customers, how ready do you think the marketplace is to work in a model like that where you, you don't so much buy a finished thing as you buy a part of a process? That's Anyone the toughest going? one at the end. <laughs> uh, if I had the answer to that, oh boy. I mean, the, oh, this no. is why the as a service seems so appealing because it, it makes you not have to worry about all those sticky details under the provisioning and execution of how that service happens. I, I but, think there's a, there's a trust and there's a guarantee of resource availability that's needed on this. So I think the trust thing is until people actually have built confidence that those different models can work, they're going to be reticent. And I think the as a service um, concept is, you know, again, people are very used to knowing they've got this box connected to that box connected to that box. So as long as they're there physically, they know that they've got something that's going to work. The concept of actually future reserving or future reservation of things that don't yet exist um, and and having confidence that when we spin it up 15 minutes before it's needed, that we can actually build a virtual ecosystem. That that's that's where I think the confidence the, the confidence element needs to come in, and and where we will again be having to really leverage um, you know what's going on in the IT world and the experience from that to work out how to deploy exactly those things to people who are not necessarily experts in that area. And I think what, you know, what the VSF, what the AMWA and so on can really do about this is to still be looking at those best practices and, and the learnings from, from the IT industry and thinking about how we can yeah, build around NMOS, um, the kind of in infrastructure provisioning and service management um, that can deliver that, not just for the, for the top end broadcasters who can who can afford to build facilities with teams of people with these new skills, but for for everybody. Indeed. Well, I think uh, Mr. Gilmer, we're going to return the floor to you. All right. Excellent. I really thank all of you, uh, your panelists very much for their participation. Great coverage of the topic, and I'd also like to thank. Um, Richard and Hans for, for being on earlier as well. Thank you guys.